Okay, so this is the, uh, the first day of the Ayurvedic Nutrition Challenge that, um, is, um, that I've created um, that is um, partially online but mostly experiential in your own, um, in your own home. And um, so in this first video, I'm going to explain the overview of the challenge itself. Um, what it's going to look like week by week um, and also what you can kind of expect as you go through the challenge yourself. Um, and so I think I'd just like to start with the word challenge um, and what exactly that means, what it means to me anyway. Um, so when we think about um, a challenge, we certainly think about you know, challenging ourselves as we go forward. But I think when we're thinking specifically about uh, nutrition or some kind of a dietary regimen, what we're really looking for is long lasting change. Um, we're looking to adopt healthier lifestyle practices. We're looking to facilitate an authentic and deeper way of being healthy um, in the world in which we live. And so in that regard, I think Ayurveda has a ton um, to offer us because it provides us with methods that actually produce an authentic change. So I say that um, as a precursor because the first week of the challenge, what we're going to be doing mostly is just working with our actual behavior um, and the way in which we eat rather than what specifically it is that we're eating. Um, because again, what we're trying to generate with the challenge is an authentic change within ourself. Um, I mean, I think everybody wants to be free, essentially, of engaging in challenges in a way. Um, you know, we want to be free of being dependent on, on lists and on dietary programs. And most of us want to be living spontaneously healthy. We want to desire the things that are good for our bodies, um, and we want to live in alignment with our, our health. So that's what we're really trying to facilitate here um, in this Ayurvedic challenge. We're trying to facilitate an authentic and actual shift in the way in which we eat and how we relate to food. And so that quite frequently begins with our actual behavior and how we're eating. Um, rather than what we're eating. So that's kind of the theme um, for the first week. As we go into the second week, um, we start to learn deeper methods of observation. Um, I think that this is another really interesting and amazing feature of Ayurvedic uh, dietetics and Ayurvedic practices because there are so many different dietary philosophies that are out there now. Um, there are you know, and they, and they often conflict each other and they often contradict each other. And it can be very confusing for most of us when we're trying to figure out what the best diet is for our bodies. But Ayurveda actually offers these really distinct methods of observation that we can use to know if our dietary practices are working for us or if they're working against us. So our bodies actually communicate to us whether these things are, are life supporting for us or not. And, um, those will be really interesting tools for you to learn and, and be able to continue and, and adopt. Um, Ayurveda does teach that there's an importance of dietary individualization. So one diet doesn't necessarily benefit one person, um, while another diet may actually you know, bring harm or um, deplete another person. So knowing these telltale signs uh, of whether our diets are working for us or not can be a really powerful aid as we continue on the path of health. The third week, that's when we really do start to get into some dietary augmentation. Um, as I just mentioned, there's lots of dietary individualization that's made in Ayurvedic nutrition. It's dependent on what is called your doshic constitution. And um, your doshic constitution is like your mind-body type. So each person has a unique mind-body type, has a unique digestive type, and, um, and that, that determining what your ideal type is helps us to augment and, um, and change the diet accordingly. But there's one specific diet that's called the sattvic diet. 
And the word sattva is something that you hear in yogic practices a lot. And a sattvic, it means like clarity, illumination, accurate perception, um, joy, the ability to see the truth, radiance. And so there are these sattvic foods that we can eat that help to generate, um, hi Ray and Phyllis. Um, so the, the, there are these sattvic dietary practices that we can actually use to help facilitate sattvic quality in the mind. Um, so in the third week, we're going to all adopt a sattvic diet. And, and with doing that, there is um, some dietary augmentation and things that you can eat and things that you shouldn't eat. So again, the first week, we're just adopting behavioral adaptations. The third week, we're learning more about self-observation methods and methods that we can use in our diet. Um, and we're also going to include um, the six tastes during the third week as well. Um, and then as we go into the third week, we start to adopt sattvic diet, um, dietary practices. In the fourth week, we're actually going to practice intermittent fasting. And so this is kind of the most challenging week of them all, but we will, as of this point, been doing a lot of work to prepare ourself for the fourth week. And, um, and we'll be offered two different types of intermittent fasting practices. Uh, so intermittent fasting is something that's becoming more and more popular um, today. And um, it generally refers to abstaining for food for at least an 8 to 12 period of time and then eating at set periods of time. And there's sort of different variances or philosophies on intermittent fasting, actually how to do it. But in general, it's just giving your digestion uh, the space and the opportunity to rest. And um, whenever we allow our digestion to rest, we facilitate healing within the body and within the mind. And Ayurveda has been using an intermittent fasting practice for thousands of years. And basically it teaches that you know, we should be eating our largest meal midday for the, the midday period, our lunch essentially, and eating the smallest meal for dinner. Or dinner could be even supplemental, or you could even skip dinner all, all together. Um, and so that's giving this, the body the space to rest, and then at breakfast time you resume normal eating pattern. Um, so we're going to experiment with that as well. Um, so this is a 30-day challenge, um, with each week being marked by a different theme. I'm going to be having live classes here every Monday morning at 10 a.m. And so the live classes, I really, I, I would like them to be as much discussion-based as possible, um, giving you the opportunity to answer, ask questions that you may have or share your experience from the week before. Um, and then I'll also go through the highlights of what it is that you're going to be doing your practices for the week coming ahead. Um, you know, I made an ebook um, that I sent out this morning and is also still available on my Facebook page. You, if you haven't downloaded that Facebook that ebook, you'll definitely need it. Um, it gives an overview of the practices that we'll be doing each week. Um, and so the ebook and the live talks kind of give you the bare bone of what practices that you'll need, be, need to be doing each week. But I want to tell you that between each week period, I'll be posting live videos on the Facebook page that will give you video demos, most often of the foods that we're eating, because sometimes people don't know what kitchari, for example, which is an Ayurvedic cleanse soup, we'll learn how to make that, um, what it's supposed to look like, what its consistency is supposed to be look like. So I'm going to try to communicate as best as I can through um, video demos, or like ghee, for example, um, is a tough one to communicate in writing alone, and it helps to have a visual aid to actually see what does ghee look like when it's done, and a ghee is a type of clarified butter. So between the live classes, I'll be posting videos like that on the Facebook page that will hopefully help you in, um, in creating a lot of these amazing treasures on your own. And um, I'll also be posting um, videos that if you want to take the practices a step further, if you want to deepen the theoretical knowledge, um, you can. So, I mean, me as a practitioner and teacher of Ayurveda, this is definitely a learning process for me. It's, you know, it's taking very sometimes complex theoretics and communicating it in a way that's actually applicable and real into our lives. So what I've, I've hoped to have done is, um, is, again, created sort of this bare bones teaching where like each week I'm giving the live lectures and in your ebook you can follow along and that's what you have to do week by week. But if you want to take it a step further, if you want to learn a little bit more, then just stay abreast of the videos that I'm posting 
and you most definitely can because it will be there. Okay, so this takes us to, um, to week one. Here we are, week one, day one of the 30-day challenge. Okay, uh, week one. So the characteristics of week one are just starting to open ourselves up to observing the self and um, observing our, our relationship with food. Um, Ayurveda, you know, teaches that each person is equipped with an inner knower. So everyone has an, an inner knower uh, within them. And that inner, inner knower knows our ideal dietary practices, our ideal lifestyle practices, etc. Um, but sometimes access to the inner knower gets blocked. It gets blocked by, you know, our stress, our stresses, our fears, our um, projections, our worries, our day-to-day -day lifestyle responsibilities, being caught up, so caught up in activity that we're not giving ourselves the space to quiet ourselves, etc. So the, the access to the inner knower can get blocked. And so it's, it's most frequently through meditation practices that we can help to settle the mind and we can reclaim that connectivity to that inner knower. Um, but also just in observing, you know, self-observation, taking a moment to step back can really diffuse and disempower many of the activities and behaviors that we want to break away from. Um, so week one, that's sort of the theme, is stepping into self-observation and starting to alter our behavior and, um, and how we eat rather than what we eat. Ayurveda is yoga sister science. So we'll just backtrack a little bit and just give a little bit of history of what Ayurveda is. Um, so they come from the same family. Uh, Ayurveda and yoga were taught together as a prescriptive practice for thousands of years. Yoga is more of the spiritual discipline, so it's focused on self-realization, becoming your best and most high, highest self-realized self in this lifetime. And Ayurveda provided the, the health and the wellness practices, so the practices that would keep the physical body healthy so that it never became an impediment on the path to self-realization. So within those health practices, we have things like diet, we have things like herbs, we have preventative therapies like um, cleanse practices and detox regimens that we follow at specific times of the year. Um, there are these universal lifestyle practices that everybody shares together. And those universal lifestyle practices are ruled by the cycles and seasons in nature because Ayurveda teaches that each one of us has a really profound and important relationship with nature. Um, and so when we live in alignment with the cycles and seasons in, in nature, we support our health. But when we detour or desynchronize from the cycles in nature, we foster disease processes of all kinds. So all of the lifestyle practices work to sync us up to the cycles in nature. Uh, for example, there's the 24-hour cycle of the sun. So Ayurveda teaches to live in alignment with the cycle of the sun. We rise with the sun. We eat our largest meal midday when the sun is the strongest. We go to sleep at night when the sun goes down. There's the cycle of the seasons. So to live in alignment with the season, there are these different daily lifestyle practices that we f can follow that are, that are ruled by the seasons, but also um, you know, eating a seasonal diet would be another way. There's the 28 and a half day cycle of the moon, and there's different practices, more spiritual based practices that help to foster our relationship with the moon, and et cetera. So there are many other lifestyle practices like that that we, that we share. Um, as far as Ayurvedic nutrition goes, um, that kind of follow, creates a foundational and fundamental practice that we all share together. And we'll be speaking about that in just one minute. Um, but Ayurveda, not only is it a lifestyle practice, but it's also a medical system. And it, its medical system addresses that each person is an individual, and that individuality is created by their mind, body, constitution, or doshic type. And understanding what your individual mind, body type is helps us to determine what ideal lifestyle practices, ideal dietary practices um, are best for us. Um, however, before we even get to that, you know, before we get to, you know, what, what am I as an individual, it's really the, the, the groundwork, the foundation is built upon what we all share together, which is essentially 
the season, the seasonal changes and the daily lifestyle practices that we all share together. And, um, and those are really powerful unto themselves. I think sometimes we can get really caught up in not knowing what our dosha is or getting confused about what our dosha is. So I just want to say that, that step one is laying the groundwork and the foundation for lifestyle anyway. And so that's the starting place. And a lot of us can hang out there for quite a while as the practices are very powerful unto themselves. Um, okay. So Ayurveda is a lifestyle practice um, and a medical system. And the lifestyle practices are, we have many lifestyle practices that we all share together. And then we have some lifestyle practices that set us apart that are determined by our mind, body type or our doshic constitution. Um, so I'm going to bring a little bit of, you know, science in there when we talk about circadian rhythm function, because the study of circadian rhythms really is really, really interesting from an Ayurvedic perspective. It really gives some science behind what these yogis have been talking about and teaching um, for thousands and thousands of years. So a circadian rhythm generally refers to all of our biological and physiological functions, and they actually run together on a 24-hour cycle or clock. And the 24-hour cycle or clock of our circadian rhythm function is first instigated by um, our initial exposure to light in the morning. So when we wake up in the morning and we open our eyes and light goes into our eye, that, is this, that stimulates the, the body to start running on this 24-hour cycle. It's, it's time to begin. And so that first exposure of light entrains the 24-hour cycle of our circadian rhythm function. And so if we lived out in nature, then, you know, when we rose, we would rise with the sun and that would change throughout the year, depending on what the season is. Um, but for most of us who are exposed to a lot of artificial lighting, um, we have just different sort of disruptions in our circadian rhythm function, mostly um, in how melatonin is secreted. And melatonin is our sleep hormone. Not only is it a sleep hormone, but it's a really, really powerful antioxidant, actually. And so one of the reasons why circadian rhythm function became so um, noticed was because people who worked overnight shifts, specifically overnight nurse shift workers, had higher incidence of breast cancer and cardiovascular disease. And so that started to draw attention from scientists and researchers of why was this happening. And so when they took a closer look, they saw, oh, wow, you know, they're staying awake all throughout the night and um, they're, not, they're not secreting melatonin in the way that they should be. They're not getting this really powerful antioxidant. And then when they looked at the um, overnight workers across the board, they noticed these very similarities in different health dysfunctions that they were experiencing. Um, so it's very interesting uh, from an Ayurvedic perspective. Um, and how powerful melatonin is and can be. Um, so light stimulation is one of the instigators of our 24-hour cycle, our circadian rhythm function, but so is our eating time. So every time we eat, we also stimulate different um, enzymes in the liver specifically, and that, that can be just as powerful. Actually, a lot of the research that's coming out now is saying that our actual eating times is more powerful at facilitating irregularities or regularities in circadian rhythm function. Um, and so this kind of just gives a little bit of support from what Ayurveda is talking about, the importance of, of sleeping every single night when the sun goes down. Um, melatonin also you know, has this 24-hour peak cycle. Uh, I'm sorry, 12-hour peak cycle. Um, and so if we were out, what this means is if we were out in nature, melatonin would start to secrete when the sun started to go down. And about six hours after its initial secretion, it would get stronger, 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 and we'd have this max um, peak secretion. And then as the sun started to rise, the melatonin would start to decrease in tandem. Um, but for most of us, again, who are underneath artificial lighting until 10 p.m. at night, 9.30, 10 p.m. at night, we're totally blocking melatonin secretion. And so a lot of us don't really feel like a natural desire to like want to go to sleep or I would say an urge, like a physical urge to go to sleep. Um, it's kind of like, I have to go to sleep now. You know, we have to, we have to sort of tell ourselves to go to sleep. Um, we kind of are all, you know, robbing ourselves of this max melatonin secretion. So, 
Um, there are different things that can be done to address that, uh, specifically with um, light bulbs and other um, applications that block the blue light. Um, you can look up blue lightless light bulbs or there are blue blocker sunglasses. I don't know if anyone remembers those. Now you can actually get um, regular glasses from your optometrist that will block the blue light um, when you wear them. They just look like regular glasses, so pretty interesting. All right. So I think I've driven the point home that regularity in sleep and then regularity in eating times is really important at maintaining our whole circadian rhythm um, synchronization and function. And circadian rhythm desynchronization, so desynchronization, that's when the circadian rhythms start to desynchronize from one another um, through, and it happens through living irregular lifestyle, um, is noted in many diseases comorbidly, everything from different psycho, psycho, psychological imbalances, specifically seasonal depression disorder, bipolar disorder, um, and also um, physiological diseases like osteoporosis and different thyroid diseases. Um, so if you're suffering from any imbalance whatsoever, just looking at the regularity and routine of your lifestyle may help in just um, supporting you to reclaiming your health. So when we look at this from what, what are we doing this week standpoint, we're going, to, um, we're going to adopt regularity in eating times. And so Ayurveda also is not the biggest fan of snacking. It's all about maximizing your digestive strength and your digestive function. And so if you eat at regular times and you give your body space between each time that you eat, you essentially strengthen your digest digestion. And digestion is the epicenter of the immune system in the body. Um, this is where we start to assimilate all the nutrients and nutrients, and these nutrients go on to form all the tissue layers in the body. And so keeping digestion really strong and healthy is imperative to living a really healthy lifestyle. So Ayurvedic dietetics actually is all about protecting our digestive fire. And so when we look more closely at the dietary individualizations, again, that correspond to your mind-body constitutional type, there tends to be these different digestive tendencies. And so the dietary augmentations address these tendencies and reduce um, the negative tendencies that are sometimes inherent in the doshic types. So there's a little bit of more background information on dietary individualization. So step one is eating at regular times. And so that doesn't have to be down to the minute, um, but within about the hour. And so we want to have, you know, breakfast sometime between 7 a.m. and 8 a.m. And then lunch, which is the largest meal of the day, would be at some point between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. And then dinner, which is the supplemental meal, the smallest meal of the day, is eaten somewhere around 6.30, between 6.30 and 7.30. Um, and so then we're not eating at all after 8 p.m. Um, and again, this is in brief in that ebook, so you should definitely download the ebook if you haven't downloaded it, or just take really good notes if you prefer, but the, the ebook, this is all written out for you. Um, so in doing that, we're giving our body, we're starting to give our body the space and the time to rest. And so we want to think about what does that mean exactly to have your largest meal of the day midday? Um, it certainly means largest in quantity and largest in caloric value. Um, I find that it's easier for most people to take the meal as close to 2 p.m. as possible. That just something about that 1.30, 2 o'clock window for most people that if you eat that large meal at that time kind of makes the rest of the day uh, smooth sailing and so you don't really feel like extremely hungry um, in the evening and so you're not you know, really suppressing yourself or very uncomfortable. Um, so certainly highest in caloric value um, and, um, and in mass as well. This would be the best time of the day to eat dessert. So if you have a sweet tooth, um, take your dessert at this time. And, um, and again, for the first week, we're not really making any dietary augmentations. We're just simply working with our behavior. So now we look at the evening meal and what does that mean for something to be the smallest in quantity? Is it actually in proportion? Is it in caloric value, etc.? cetera? Um, and I would say that it is definitely in both. Um, so it needs to be smaller in proportion, 
um, and then as low a calorie as possible. Um, right now we're in the, the fall and the winter season uh, here in Chicago. I'm not sure where you're watching it, um, but here in the fall and the winter time, this in Ayurvedic practices, we follow more seasonal practices as well. And so eating a more cooked foods diet that is warm and nutritive is best. So when you think about your evening meal, you definitely want it to be cooked. Um, perhaps like a bowl of you know pureed vegetable soup or vegetable soup would be good. If it were the summertime, then perhaps a small salad would be appropriate. Or if you live in a really warm tropical climate right now, then a salad would be more appropriate. You know, look at your natural environment and see what's thriving and what's in season right now. Um, so the evening meal for us Chicagoans, however, would be something that's warm, nutritive, like a stew or a curry or a soup and low in caloric value. Um, so let's say you're, you have a social obligation and you're going out, then you want to eat half portion. So eat a half size portion here. In America, we have it backwards. You know, you go out to, to lunch at a restaurant, for example, and it's the half size portion for lunch and the full gigantic proportion for dinner. So just we want to flip that backwards. Um, so the half portion is for dinner and the full portion is for lunch. Um, lots of really interesting studies on, you know, intermittent fasting and weight loss. For example, too, where, you know, they take all sorts of different animals and human beings now have been studied in this um, and give them exactly the same exact caloric value, but have them, you know, have them eat it at an earlier part of the day and what happens. And so mostly what happens is that people will lose substantially more weight without as much effort, um, people and animals or they'll, they'll maintain a healthy weight. So that's something interesting to think about for people that are trying to lose weight. So kind of, you know, for the first week is, you know, I mean, indulge in your lunch time, you know, meal as much as you can. Really enjoy it, savor it, make it a bigger deal perhaps than you have made before. Um, and that will really help with that dinner meal being the smallest meal of the day. Now, if you get to dinner and let's say you're starving, um, how do you handle that? So my suggestion is um, <laughs> my suggestion is to eat if you're hungry. So I mean, don't totally force yourself and don't wrestle yourself over it. Then again, this is a challenge, so you can try to push yourself a little bit more, but um, then perhaps you would have. But I would suggest just looking at the scope of your entire day and really evaluating if. Um, your lunch meal was big enough, you know, and, and perhaps you need to eat it close, closer to 2 p.m. If you uh, have some kind of a schedule conflict, like let's say you work at night, then what you want to do, and this is actually backed by circadian rhythm scientific study as well, the most important thing that you can do is maintain regularity in your, in your lifestyle practices. So if you eat, work at a night shift, for example, which prevents you from eating at X time of day but forces you to eat at X time of day, you want to maintain that flow throughout the course of your week. And you want to make, that is going to help to keep the regularity, the synchronization of your circadian rhythm function, all of your physiological functions. Um, because the science and studies behind that actually show that it's not, it's, it's the irregularity in scheduling, the irregularity in eating times, the irregularity in sleep that creates the problem, that creates the de desynchronization. Um, so that's uh, my feedback about that. The next practice that we're going to be doing this week is following seasonal dietary augmentations. And so, you know, I don't know what season each person is living in um, as they watch this, but it's just, you know, take a moment, meditate about it, and, um, and visualize. You know, if we were living, if you were living um, on a farm right now, and you were living um, off the land, and, you know, wherever you are, you know, maybe you're by an ocean, you know, maybe you're here in Chicago, <laughs> wherever, you know, what, what would you have done to pre prepare for the season that you're currently in. So for example, us being in Chicago, we would have early fall um, canned, you know, fruits and vegetables and preserved them. We would have stored nuts and we would have stored grains. And, you know, maybe we would have um, killed an animal for its meat 
Um, we would have been trying to eat a higher fat content diet, a higher protein diet. Um, we'd be most likely cooking our food right now instead of eating it raw. Uh, so those are the lifestyle practices that you want to try to mimic as much as you can. And I know that that gets challenging for a lot of us who have access to all these modern conveniences and we go to the store and we're like, I don't even know, you know what's in season or what's not because we have access from things all over the world. Um, but in this challenge or in this approach, you, know, you just want to take a moment to just think about you know, what you would be doing if you lived a more natural lifestyle. Ayurveda teaches that those practices have health benefits. And um, if we take a step back, we can actually see that that is really true. Uh, again, taking it back to the example of us living here in Chicago, uh, if we were canning and if we were fermenting our food um, to, to preserve it, and that's what we ate through most of the latter fall and winter period, we know now, for example, that eating fermented foods um, and foods that have been preserved that way is absolutely foundational for health. That is our, our probiotic material. And within our GI tract, we have four to six pounds of this uh, probiotic material that is um, imperatively connected to our immune system function. It's, the bacteria is actually called um, the forgotten organ because it plays so many important roles in our health and well-being. It is what reduces inflammation in the GI tract. It uh, produces important vitamins and minerals. It um, helps to alert our immune system if a pathogen has invaded our body. And, and the GI tract is where 80% of pathogens enter and get into our body. So keeping digestion is really healthy is really important. And one of the primary ways that we do that is by keeping our inner ecosystem really healthy and alive. And one of the most important ways that we do that is through eating probiotic rich materials. So these fermented foods. And so a lot of the lifestyle practices in the fall and the winter will see the sort of a theme that it's, it's like, oh, it's about building digestive strength. It's about rejuvenating the physical body. It's about rest, additional re re uh, introspection. And um, the eating of probiotic materials and a higher fat content diet. So Ayurveda really, really likes ghee, for example. Um, ghee is a type of clarified butter. And it's got a lot of really amazing anti-inflammatory um, characteristics to it. It's very high in antioxidant value, but it's also really healing for the um, GI tract, for the intestinal lining. Um, so we see it again where it's like, oh, eating more amounts of fat during the fall and winter period helps with coating and healing the GI tract. Um, so intestinal healing, digestive health is uh, definitely a strong theme in our seasonal practices in the fall and the winter. So what else would we be doing here in Chicago? We'd be eating more of a cooked foods diet. So that's what we'll be starting to do in this challenge this week as well, is um, eating you know, soups, stews, curries. Um, think you know, mom's home cooked food. You know? how, would you, how would you really nourish and nurture yourself at this time of the year? Um, you know, sometimes when people talk about fall and winter, um, they don't like the winter here. And I, I used to not like the winter here too and so, and until the, the last couple of years, but I started to develop this really great appreciation for winter. And I think that, you know, part of the appreciation for winter just comes from the fact that we can't be as active as perhaps we would like to be or as much as we are in the winter, the summertime. The winter time is when we hibernate, you know? And so when we, I mean, doesn't that just sound great? You know, hibernate, rejuvenate, look inside, introspect, eat some soup. Life's not so bad. Um, okay, so that's kind of an overview. Oh, and the last practice that we're going to um, be adopting this, um, this, this, this week, excuse me, is drinking spice waters. So Ayurveda loves spices. Uh, spices are like our digestive enzymes. And so you can, um, you can use spices to influence your digestive function. So for example, pungent spices. Pungent, pungent spices are spices that they actually trigger the trigeminal nerve in your face and they increase the feeling of heat in your mouth. Um, so that would be things like garlic, onion, peppers of all kinds. Um, and so when you take pungent spices, you increase digestive fire. Um, 
If you use uh, sweet spices or bitter or astringent spices, like for example, coriander is a more bitter type spice or cilantro, um, those spices tend, or mints, you know, mints, they tend to, to cool or slow digestion. And so we can use spices again to augment our digestive function. And, um, and they also have many different medicinal properties to them, a ton of antioxidants. Turmeric, for example, which is just like amazing, actually has so many anti-carcinogenic um, properties to it and, um, and protects against Alzheimer's and many other different types of diseases. But a lot of the spices have amazing, amazing um, healing medicinal attributes to them. Clove, for example, is a really powerful antifungal, antibacterial. Basil helps to open up the lungs. It's a natural expectorant. Um, coriander is a diuretic. I mean, it's, it's really amazing how powerful these spices are. And um, so learning, learning about them and just consuming them more, and they don't have to be, they don't have to be uh, Indian spices. They don't have to be curries or turmeric or anything. You could explore Italian spices. The Italian spices are, are some of the most really powerful antifungal um, and, and antibacterial and, and tend to be the most heating as well. Um, but basil, thyme, oregano, etc. So um, just ex starting to explore the diversity of spices to build your own kitchen apothecary. So you could start to see your kitchen as sort of this apothecary or this healing center in your own home. Um, is uh, it could be a really powerful, a powerful thing. Um, but we're going to start simply, and, um, and that is to drink uh, four cups of spiced waters every single day. Um, and um, a spiced water is just that, it's a spiced water. And so you take, you know, boiling hot water, and then you could add spices of your choice and strain the spices out. I prefer to strain them out. I tend to like they tend to get stuck in my teeth and my throat and it's not comfortable for me. Some people like to keep them in, I guess it's a preference thing. Um, but if you want to, you can just put the tea, the spices inside of a tea bag and then just put it in hot water and top it with hot water um, and drink it, sip it throughout the day. So one really simple spiced water is uh, ginger root. You know, just taking a few slices of ginger root, uh, putting it in hot water. Uh, ginger root, is a um, is tridoshic. So even though it's pungent, um, which again is it, it increases the temperature of heat in your mouth, it has a special prabhava, and we'll learn about that next week. Prabhava, which means special potency. So it's like the exception to the rule. So ginger has a special potency, special thing about it that makes it okay for all three of the different doshas. All constitutions can can have ginger for the most part. Um, but in your packet, there's a spiced water recipe that's also tridoshic, so meaning that it's safe for all the different doshas to drink, um, and it's an equal por proportion of cumin, fennel, and coriander, um, and it helps, again, to just nourish uh, digestive function. And speaking of water, um, in general, we drink our water room temperature, um, and, and or hot, especially in the fall and winter period, so drinking ice-cold water is generally thought of as being depleting to uh, our digestive fire. Maybe some high pizza type people can handle that, but for most of us, drinking water without the ice is better, more supportive for digestion. It's gentler on the kidneys. It tends to be overall more nutritive and also easier for um, most people to, to digest. And so when I say that we actually digest our water, um, people that like to drink, increase their water intake, but then um, feel like they're urinating more. Um, when you spice your water or you drink it warmer, it tends not to move through your body quite as quickly, but your body actually digests it and absorbs it a little bit better. So experiment with that one. I think, I think it's like America is probably one of the only countries that um, you know, gives you lots of iced water um, and people drink a lot of cold water around here, I think, more so than most areas in the world. Okay, um, so we've spoken about uh, circadian rhythm function and how the Ayurvedic practices of regularity and sleeping and eating help to, to support and maintain circadian rhythm function. We've spoken about a seasonal diet and how, you know, 
to, to just meditate and think about, you know, where you are in your area of the world and what practices would you be doing if you were living in tandem with nature and start to replicate those practices. Um, we talked about um, the practices that we're doing this week, which is regular eating times every day, not to the minute, but around to the hour. The largest meal of the day is midday, ideally as close to 2 p.m. as possible. And the sm smallest meal of the day is definitely before 8 p.m. And it's the su smallest or supplemental meal, so something that's smaller in proportion, lower in cal caloric value, and easy to digest. So definitely um, cooked is important and not eating at all past 8 p.m. We talked about um, drinking four cups of spiced water a day. So th those are our lifestyle practices for the week to come. I have included in your packet uh, the spiced water recipe as well as a recipe for ghee and a recipe for lassi. So ghee, we talked about it in brief already, but ghee is a type of clarified butter that's really healing and nutritive for the GI tract. It also has a really high heat index, so like co coconut oil does, where you can, you can actually saute spices and vegetables, etc. in it, and it won't turn carcinogenic like most oils will, like olive oil will if you cook with it. Um, and ghee has many different antioxidants and nutritive benefits for the body. It's considered an anupana in Ayurveda. So an anupana, an, the word anupana means vehicle. So a vehicle, so it's like um, it carries all the nutritive properties of the spices and herbs and foods that it's cooked with deeper into the tissues. So it's like a little car, the spices get on and it carries them right into your body. Um, so it's an anupana. A lassi. So a lassi is a type of probiotic beverage and it basically is diluted yogurt or diluted buttermilk. Um, and so drinking a lassi a day just helps to diversify and populate the, the microbiome in the gut. Um, so I have a really simple lassi recipe that's included in your packet, which is just um, yogurt, water, and I like monk fruit sugar. I don't know if you have discovered that yet or not, but it's pretty amazing stuff. Um, it tastes very similar to sugar, but it's actually got a lot more health benefits. It's not quite as detrimental as um, sugar is really to the body. Um, and it's something that you can pick up at most natural grocery stores. So it's called monk fruit sugar. So I did put that in the packet um, as an alternative. So it's just water, yogurt, and monk fruit sugar. Um, but you can take it a step further and add different spices to it if you want, again, to influence your digestive function. Uh, and you could, if you want to, Google more lossy recipes or just experiment with them. Um, using cardamom and rose water, for example, tends to be more cooling for the digestive tract. Using uh, cinnamon and cardamom in your lassi tends to be more heating and stimulating to the digestive tract. Um, yummy, that sounds really good. Someone suggested uh, lassi, cilantro, ginger, cumin seed. Yum, that sounds really good. Um, Surely, so on the same pe page as my Facebook group page, there's a link um, and it it's, I think it's just a couple posts before this one, and it's, it says that you, you have to download this ebook. I'll, po I'll post it again, but if you just look a couple posts, maybe even just one before, you'll find, you'll find the ebook um, link. Okay, um, so there's a recipe for lassi, and so if you have um, Pamela, you can eat it with your you can eat it with your lunchtime meal, if you want. You could either eat it with the meal, or you could eat it as a standalone. Um, sort of like a, a breakfast or something like that if you want to as well. Um, so we having lassi a day. If you have some kind of dairy intolerance that, that prevents you from having dairy, um, you could experiment with, you know, a coconut-based yogurt if you want. I feel like a lot of the ones that are in the store that are coconut yogurts aren't the greatest. Um, they tend to have a lot of carrageenan in, in, in them. And um, carrageenan is, you know, very uh, infl inflammatory to the body and other different types of weird sweeteners, etc. Um, a lot of like the juiceries now that are around have uh, higher quality um, coconut yogurt. Um, and if you wanted to, of course, you can make your own coconut yogurt. There's a, and your own yogurt for that matter. Um, there's a really great website called Cultures for Health. Cultures for Health. I love this website. Um, they have like many different types of strains of yogurt that you can make really easily just on your countertop. 
um, and um, kefir and et cetera, um, that you can, um, you can actually purchase the strains and many different tutorials that you can learn how to make a lot of just interesting probiotic foods and fermented vegetables. So that may be something worth checking out as well. Um, Ed, kombucha, yeah, kombucha is good. Um, a lot of times, especially for vata types and pittas, it could be a little bit too sour, sour in taste. Um, uh, well, for vata types, the carbonation actually can be aggravating for them. And for pittas it can, and kapas, it can be a little bit sour. Um, so bear with me while these terms just come out if you don't understand what I'm saying. Um, but again, we're going to learn about the taste ne next week. But sour. Sour, like your citrus, limes, and fruits, and as well as all of your ferments, like kombucha and yogurt for that matter, and, and wine, and um, anything that's been fermented, is considered to be sour in taste. And sour taste stimulates the juices in the small intestine, it enhances digestibility, and it's very heating. So sours can be a little bit aggravating in excess for the pitta and the kapha types especially, where it just starts to aggravate, aggravate their digestion. Um, but in smaller amounts, it's okay. So, um, so to, to answer that in brief, kombucha can be okay for some types. If it, if it works well with your body and it feels good and it feels like it's, it's benefiting you, then um, that's great. I actually really love, if you're in Chicago, I do really, really love um, Arise kombucha, A-R-I-Z-E, um, that's at some um, coffee shops and natural grocers that started by this guy, uh, Nathan Wise. I think it's like the best kombucha ever, and he has some really interesting flavors like Palo Santo, um, ginger, really yummy. Um, but yes, so just observe your own digestive strength and how you sort of respond, and it's important to get the daily probiotic material, and so if you're vegan or if you have a dietary intolerance to yogurt and you need an alternative, kombucha could be it, depending on how you respond to it. Um, okay, so I think that that is it. I'm going to um, see if there are any questions now. I know that I missed some, and I'll definitely answer them as when the talks are over. What are your thoughts on lemon water? Lemon water is great. Um, lemon water is really flushing for the lymphatic system, especially if you drink it early in the morning. Um, and that actually kind of ties into the Ayurvedic um, daily practices, the Dinacharya practices, where um, in the morning if you drink a really, you know, a large glass of room temperature water with a twist of lemon, it helps to flush the lymphatic system. Yummy, Aaron. <laughs> All right, well, so this week, so if you think of any other questions, and I will answer the questions that were posted, um, and again, download the ebook if you haven't downloaded it yet. This week, I'm going to post a video on how to make ghee and um, how to make a few variations of lassi as well as um, how to make a spiced water, although I think that those are pretty clear. And then um, when you get the opportunity to, the sooner the better, I have a, a self-assessment tool available that you can use to help you to start learning about what your individual Ayurvedic constitution is and sort of the introduction to Ayurvedic concepts. Um, so I'm gonna post that as well on my page. The sooner that you kind of go through that, which it will take about an hour and a half, the better. Uh, because by week three, we will be talking more about doshas and, um, and dietary individualization. So the more that you can sort of familiarize yourself with those concepts, as well as observe um, the doshic qualities within yourself, so you can gain more confidence in what your, your type is and your understanding, uh, the better. So the sooner you can do that, the better. And um, I think that that is, that is it. Um, can you drink spice waters after 8 p.m.? Yes. Yes, you can. Anything that's kind of like zero calorie or tea or anything like that um, would be fine after 8 p.m. Thank you, Father. Thanks, Anne. All right. Well, thank you so very much. Um, if you have any questions, you can post them or you can uh, share them next week. Because like I said, I, I do want the, 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 um, 
the talks to be um, interactive so you can share your experience or um, share any questions that you have. But thank you so much. It's really uh, promising to me that you're interested in this information. It makes me excited. And I'm very, very happy to, to share it with you. So thank you.